Hey guys, it's Ashley, and today's video is going to be on some end time parables from Matthew 24 and 25. All right, guys, so in chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew, I have found five parables and two explanations all in regards to the end times. Even though the context is for the end times from my perspective, we could still read them for today as well. All right, so Matthew 24. The first parable is going to be starting off in verse 32. So it would be helpful to read all of Matthew 24 leading up to verse 32, just so you kind of know where we're at. And I have videos um, that I've done on that. You can check them out on my, on my YouTube channel. All right, verse 32. Now learn this parable... From the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, what's he talking about? Jesus is talking about all the things that he just talked on. And that's why you'd want to read all of Matthew 24. So he was talking about so many things, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, the abomination of desolation. You need to know what that is. If you don't, go to my other videos. Um, he's talking about persecution, betrayal. I mean, so many things. And he says, when all these things take place, pretty much, that's what he's saying. Know that it is near at the doors. Verse 34, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. All right. So parable one, fig tree. He is saying that when we start to see things manifest, all the things that Matthew just got done describing. I mean, it was Jesus, but Matthew was writing for Jesus. When you see all these things, just like you see a tree and it's starting to bud, like you know, you know, summer is near. You know it. We all know it, right? When it's spring, we're walking, you know, the, the coldness is gone and we start to see things bloom. We know within weeks or months, probably less probably a month at the latest, we, we know summer is here. And so he's trying to hit home with that. And he says, this generation, we need to understand what is a generation because he's saying all those things, the famines, the earthquakes, the abomination, desolation, the persecution, all of that. He says, it's going to happen in one generation. So when I looked up the Greek meaning of the word generation, I believe what I read was 30 years. But I've also have heard, I've not fact checked this, but I've heard a generation can be up to 100 years as well, um, just based on just like a generation in the Bible. But regardless, whether it's 30 years or up to 100 years, that's not that long and that really could be a person's lifespan even even the 100 year mark because a lot of people are living up to 100 so again all the things that jesus spoke on that's why you want to read matthew 1 verses 1 through 31 to get that clear picture we started doing a little well we did do that in another video and so we were writing down them and so like some of the things that he, what he was talking about were air and bold um, there'll be deception. People will be saying that he is the Christ. There's a lot of them. All of these things are what he was talking on. And all of them are going to happen before his return and happen in one generation. All right. That's parable number one of the fig tree. All right. Now the next section of scripture is more an explanation. And 
and I see a parable towards the end of this little segment. Um, when the Bible was translated over, they did the, the best they could to just organize scriptures and all of that. But we have to remember, the Bible originally wasn't written like, like it is here. You know, I mean, the words were here, the, the words were here, but it wasn't categorized the way it is now. And so sometimes the way it's currently categorized, it, it could have been maybe categorized a little different, maybe a little bit more, I don't know what the word would be. Um, I guess, I don't want to use the word correct, saying like, I'm... I would do it different than these amazing scholars, but anyways, I'm rambling. So we're going to read Matthew 36 through 41. It's not a parable, it's just an explanation. But then I see a parable with verses 42 through 44. All right, so verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. So Jesus is talking about like his return. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the son of man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taking, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and the other left. Okay, so that's kind of pretty much the explanation. And it's so interesting because we just got done reading and hearing on how we can know around the time of Jesus' second coming, right? We know he's coming after all the things we talked on. And then Jesus is like, but you don't know the exact hour or day. And I, I think there's truth there. I think a lot of people who believe um, like the rapture is like before the seven years will use will use this explanation. And, and, and it, I mean, it's true. We don't know the day or hour, but it is so clear. We so know the season. We so know the season. And so... I really do think Jesus is coming at the end of the seven years. So many scriptures can prove that. And we still have to honor, though, we don't know the exact day or hour. Um, if we look at that seven-year tribulation, and we'll look at it in a, in a few weeks ahead, I'll do a big, nice, I have, oh, I have it with me right here. Oh, I don't have it with me. But I thought I did. Well. It's okay. It just means I'm not supposed to do it right now. But I do have a, a, a seven-year tribulation timeline that I, I put together. And based on scriptures like Revelation 11, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Daniel 7, Daniel 12, those are all scriptures that are zoning into the last three and a half years, okay? It says saints are given into the hands of the Antichrist for time, times, and a half a time. That's the last three and a half years. It says the Antichrist is given authority to continue for 42 months. That's the last three and a half years. It says that Israel will go into the wilderness where there's a place prepared for her and she'll be fed for 1,260 days. That's the last three and a half years. You guys, there's, I believe, eight verses, maybe nine, that are totally zoning into the last three and a half years. And then it stops. Why does it stop? Why does the Antichrist only have authority for those um, 42 months? Why does it say that saints are given into his hands for only those, that time, times, and half a time? Again, all of that language, 42 months, time, times, and half a time, 1,206 days, it's all the last three and a half years. The two witnesses prophesy the last three and a half years from my perspective. Why are so many verses stopping right there at the end of the last three and a half years? Because 
Jesus is coming back. But again, we don't know the exact day, the exact hour, but we so know the season. And so that's my little nugget on the explanation of Matthew 24, verses 36 through 41. Now for a parable. So the... Let me just get my notes. The second parable is now here. Verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And it's true. We don't know the exact hour. But <laughs> know this. So watch. You don't know the hour Jesus is coming. But know this if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into therefore you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect i really believe he is coming at an hour that is not expected if you're not watching. If you're watching, again, and I mean, I don't want to, I, I, Holy Spirit, Jesus, I would never, ever want to misinterpret your words. Never, especially the red ones. Ooh, but I really think, and I mean, I could be wrong, but I think we can have an expectation of when he's returning. Because if we go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, it's going to be talking on how Jesus does not come as a thief for those who are watching. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 5. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So I, I read that. And so we compare that verse with what we just read. And he is coming as a thief for those who are not watching. But if you are watching, he doesn't come as a thief. Meaning, again, we can understand the season of when he's coming back. But I really want to honor, I mean, I got to honor what Jesus said. We don't know the exact hour. And and sure, there's got to be, there's got to be truth to he's coming when you don't expect it. I mean, he, he said that. At the same time, though, it's like, but Jesus, you gave me so many clues. You gave me so much meat that I kind of do know when you're coming back. So that's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. All right. So that was that second parable. Now we're moving into the third parable. The third parable is verses um, 45 through 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But... If that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. But again, it's because he stopped watching. Verse 51, and will cut him into cut him into two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. Ooh, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right. So this parable, um, I believe I, I see it as yes, a continued 
pretty much warning to make sure you're watching. And then it's also hitting home on as we're waiting for the Lord and as we are watching for him, we need to continue to be doing things and speaking things and behaving in, 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 in good ways because it really does matter what we're doing when he returns. It really does. And a couple parables down, it's going to even hit home on that more. All right, so that was that third parable, faith, the faithful and evil servant. I'll, I'll, if you're taking notes, I'll rewind for a second. So the first parable, just so you easy, is the parable of the fig tree. Okay. Then we have an explanation on no one knows the day or hour. Then we have a second parable of the thief. And just now we read the third parable of the faithful and evil servant. All right. Now, this is a beautiful one, and I'm not going to go in depth because I've done so many videos on this. So I think what I'll do is I'll just put a video on the bottom that's hitting home with this parable. But the next parable is going to be about the wise and foolish virgins. It is probably my favorite section of scripture, like outside of Psalms 91. And pretty much, I'm just going to just paraphrase it because I'll put a video on the bottom. Jesus is going to be talking about how the kingdom of heaven is going to be like 10 virgins. These virgins are people like Christians. They're professing to be Christians. But in all reality, only five are really walking the walk. Only five really know Jesus and have intimacy with him. And the other five don't. And it's going to be talking about oil and lamps. And how I look at the oil and the lamps is, again, that intimacy. So what happens is um, the analogy, the parable is of a bridegroom or a groom, more so in America we say groom, and it's representing Jesus. And when the groom comes, when Jesus comes, you need oil in your lamp to go greet him. And if you don't have oil, you're not able to, to, to go out and, and, get, and, and meet with him. And again, the oil is representing intimacy with Jesus. He wants to know you and be spending time with you. You want oil in your lamps. You get oil by reading the word, praying, taking Jesus with you throughout your day. You go to him before you go to anything else. There's that's how you get oil and that's how you get intimacy. Because if Jesus was to come right now, for some reason, if I was wrong, okay, and and like he just randomly just comes, if he would come right this second, does he know you? Have you guys been talking? If not, well, then start talking to him. So when he shows up, He knows you. I did a short video a long time ago. I'll put it on the bottom. And I gave this analogy of a coffee shop. Like if you would walk into a coffee shop and you saw Jesus, would he be familiar to you? Would he, of course he would recognize you because he's Jesus. But like for real, like if you would walk into a coffee shop or you would go run errands, if you know someone and you randomly saw him at the store if you know them, you're going to go up to them and you're going to start talking and you might just pick up on conversation where you left off earlier because you were just texting the person, right? It's kind of like that. Like if you just run and he's not going to be in the store, he's not going to be on the sidewalk. When he comes back, he's coming on the sky. Okay, we'll make that clear. But I'm just trying to give this analogy of like, if you just all of a sudden see Jesus, would it be weird? Would it be awkward? Or would it be like, probably very weeping and very holy and very amazing. But I mean, but would you know him? Would you, would he know you? All right. So anyways, you can go check out more about parable um, of the 10 versions from Matthew 25 verses one through 13 with a video underneath. All right. We got two, we got one more parable 
And then we have a crazy, crazy explanation, which will be a different video. Jesus is going to be um, judging the nations. Woof that. that. That comes at the very end of 25. All right, so we've got another parable. Okay, so now we have that fifth parable, and it's going to be the parable of the talents. I see it really coming alongside of um, the parable of the faithful and evil servant that we read earlier. All right, so Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. There's a lot going on there. You should maybe just grab your Bible. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And then, yeah, there's just something nice about reading with me. For the kingdom of heaven, verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went out on a journey. All right, from my perspective, talents are going to represent money right now. So when you read this, understand that's the context. I also believe we can go beyond the context and understand that whatever the Lord has given you, even outside of money, how are you stewarding it? Okay, because we want to read these things and apply these scriptures to our life and let it be alive and active. All right, so a master gives a servant five talents, two talents, and then one talent. So yeah, one servant gets five, one gets two, and another gets one. Um, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. For any business person's like, yeah. Okay, verse 17. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Oh, it is money. There we go. We'll get confirmation right there. <laughs> Verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Hmm. After a long time. Interesting. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Pay attention. Highlight that verse, underline that verse. All right, it goes on. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 22. He also, um, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and of, of the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. Oh, Lord. Oofta. That's a good one. I would underline that. I will. Um, and it goes on. <clears throat> and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. 
and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. What has the Lord given you? Yes, there's some form of money he's given you. You may be very wealthy and that's awesome. Or you might, might, money might be a little tight, but there is some type of money in front of you. I'm going to encourage you to sow it and tithe it. However, the Lord's leading. I mean, even if you only have $1 to your name, well then give a quarter away. <laughs> you guys, there is something really, really important about tithing. And then um, outside of money, even things, um, you know, even, even let's say you bake cookies, give maybe some of your cookies to the, your neighbor, or maybe you have some extra clothes, giving some of your clothes away, or maybe it's time or just um, being kind or friendly or meeting with someone for coffee who needs encouragement. We he has given us all kinds of things. And I think every type of thing he's given us, we want to sow back into the kingdom of God some way, somehow. And so I would sit with the Lord and I would be like, Jesus, what, what, you know, what things have you given me? How am I steward these things? How can I give back to you? So we are that servant that's that sowing, sowing back into the kingdom of God. All right, the next one, and we're not going to go over it today. We'll do a different video, but we end with an explanation on Jesus judging the nations. This is mind-boggling, so amazing, so make sure you come back probably next week <laughs> for this um, last explanation that's end times related, definitely end times related. We can totally use some things from this explanation now, but it's woofed up, totally it's so good. All right, guys. God bless. Thanks for staying with me. You are loved. Bye.